So our talk is titled, What's Sauce for the Goose is Sauce for the Gander, Reproducible Practice in Library Work. I'm Danica Lewis. I'm the Collections and Research Librarian for Life Sciences at North Carolina State University. And I'm Heidi Tebby. I'm the Collections and Research Librarian for Engineering and Data Science at NC State University. Um, so we talk a lot about helping researchers to be reproducible, um, but we also do work that could benefit from being reproducible. Um, and so that's going to be sort of the, the angle we take on the issue in our presentation. Um, so this is all really good practice um, and it's good to have um, personal experience to draw on when faculty ask you, how do I make a code book or where can I share my code? Um, and it helps to have that sort of built in empathy with what they're going through. Um, so a quick um, disclosure before we leap in, um, we've, um, it's all more like guidelines, what we're going to be talking about, right? We've got a tweet from Josh Peak um, that says, I am coming to believe that truly best practice in science is to deeply, thoroughly understand, quote, best practice, and then do what is better for you instead. So um, you do you, essentially. We'll talk about theoretically what generally one ought to do, but in the end, you should make decisions based on what works best for you. Um, we'll also be speaking from our specific context, which is that we work with collections data, specifically in the library. Um, so it's fairly standardized formats and analyses that we just run over different sets, looking at different years or different vendors or different subsets of data. Um, so it's um, analyses that we can um, reproduce and that it makes sense to be able to um, rerun or to share with others. Um, we do really like to use R, which is an open source statistical programming language. So you'll hear us mention R and R specific resources um, a lot. Um, and so with that said, we're gonna um, jump straight into file directory and file naming. Um, so this is a, a screenshot of an imaginary version of how our files should look um, because they don't usually always get organized this way. Um, but as a best practice exercise, maybe um, this, this would be nice to do. Um, so you might see we've got one file in there, um, an R project file. That um, is something you can set up in R Studio and it helps sets a root directory and helps manage your files. Um, so in general, every project should have its own root directory. You should have separate files for data images and scripts. And then most importantly, you should have a readme file, which you know is obviously the first file we all create when we set about on a project. Um, we are librarians, we love and value documentation, but in the same way that doctors can be the worst patients, we sometimes don't give ourselves the documentation um, that we deserve. So um, a quick quick background on readmes. Um, it's the software land version of it's in the syllabus. Um, when you open up a GitHub repo for a piece of code, the readme is automatically displayed like a home page. And so it will have, usually most of them have um, configuration, installation, operating instructions, a file manifest, copyright and licensing information, contact information known bugs, troubleshooting, acknowledgements, and news. Um, so that's the sort of general best practice. Um, and again, it's all about what works right for you and, and your context. So um, as an example, this is an example readme that I wrote um, concealing the name of the publisher the project was originally about. My readmes generally have the context of what I was trying to do and what my goals were. Um, whether or not I got all of the script working or how much of it was working or if there were things I was saving until I had more time to revisit them later because they were nice but not essential. Um, and then a file manifest um, which includes a sort of lazy code book and more information about um, where the data come from, right? So it's all about what's useful to you. Eventually, I would like to share my scripts more broadly, and at that point, it would probably be a good idea to start incorporating copyright and contact sections in those as well. Um, and then just quickly, the README is meant to be opened and read sort of no matter what, so they are typically written in .txt or um, .md file format. 
And we're going to turn it over to Heidi to talk more about markdown files. Okay, so um, a .md file is a markdown file, and markdown is a lightweight markup language, which means it uses simple syntax, it's easy to write in any text editor, and it's easy to read even in its, in its raw form. HTML is also a lightweight markup language. Because readability was the design goal for Markdown, its syntax is comprised of punctuation characters instead of tags like in HTML, but Markdown is easily converted to HTML and other document format, formats like PDFs. Markdown has an informal specification, which means you'll see different flavors of Markdown <laughs> in the wild, with GitHub flavored Markdown being one of the more commonly used variants. Danica and I both write our README files in Markdown using the Atom text editor. And if you want to learn more about Markdown, we've included a link to a tutorial site here. Now this is a, a sample of what Markdown looks like. On the left is the raw Markdown, on the right is what the render version looks like. And this is in the, using the Markdown preview package in Atom. So as you can see, it's easy to do formatting like headers, bold, italics, lists, and even emojis, and it's still readable in that raw format. I'll turn it back to Danica. Right. So somewhere in the mix of all of this, in a way that makes sense for you in your context, there should be some sort of code book, um, which is essentially just an explanation of your data. Um, I often incorporate this into the file manifest of a readme, but for larger projects, a codebook can be an entire separate file that can be many, many pages long. Um, and we see sometimes when we get data from vendors, um, it's often the codebook-ish sort of thing often exists as a separate um, sheet in the Excel file. Um, so things that you generally want to be sure are in your code book um, are um, the variable names. So the short column header in the data, typically they'll have no spaces and no symbols and maybe some numbers. Um, so for example, if you've got var, VAR1, um, it probably stands for variable one, um, but beyond that, it's pretty inscrutable, which is why you really want to make sure you also have a variable label in your code book which is the full description of the variable, clarifying the name and the allowable value ranges. And you want those allowable value ranges in there for sanity checking, just in case something gets entered wrong and you've got 9,999 and you can go back and say whether or not that's realistically possible. Um, so you also want to be clear about how you encode missing or omitted data. Different um, programs that you might use will have different standards. For R, it's capital N, capital A. For um, programs like SAS, it's just a period. Um, and then sometimes you can have like large negative numbers so that it's easy to see in an analysis when something's been included accidentally. Um, but so for collections where we're looking at use a lot, um, zero use, omitted use, or missing use are three very different things. And so we want to know what it is we're dealing with, whether that zero means no one used the resource because no one likes it and we should get rid of it, or if the zero means that no one could get access to that resource because something happened to our proxy server that month and it was down, or, um, or if zero means that we weren't subscribing yet that month and so no one could or should have had access. So, and then you do also finally want to treat dates all the same way, um, pick a standard date time format and stick with it. Um, we found sometimes Excel um, makes it difficult to do this if you're importing things in and out of Excel. Um, the ISO standard is to have the four, um, the four numbers for the year and then two for the month and two for the day. Um, but generally you want to stick, pick a standard that makes sense to you and then keep with it. And then we just wanted to, to share a couple of other links that have examples, um, other examples for code books and readme's. The Data Curation Network has a repository of data curation primers for software such as R, Excel, and Tableau. And the Codebook Cookbook from Patrick Belial of McGill describes um, a, a, another data documentation process. 
And then, you know, Danica was talking about including an ex explanation of your data in the code book. And sometimes you'll find that providers of usage data aren't always great about doing the same thing. Um, so we had an example of a vendor who gives us an option to save the output of a search at different levels of detail. However, there's no documentation about what fields are included in, the, in any of those. So you have to kind of do a search and figure it out. Um, so I decided to create my own documentation. I did searches um, uh, and, and save the search results at each, each of the levels and then wrote an R script to pull out the differences and save those lists of variables into a text file. So next time I do a search, you know, I know um, which columns are included in which level. And I also shared these lists back with the vendor so they have them now. Um, and this also demonstrates one of the benefits of using a programming language for your work versus something like Excel, because now I have the script saved in case I need to, to do something similar again. Um, or if Danica needs to do something similar or say, you know, the vendor, vendor changes something, so I need to, you know, rerun the script. Right, so that brings us to um, sharing your code and generating reports and some of the um, things you can do when you um, have an analysis that you can run again rather than um, a series of clicks in, in an Excel um, sheet that's harder to reproduce. Um, so there are lots and lots of avenues to do this, um, such as Jupyter Notebooks, um, OSF, and um, sharing things through code through GitHubs. Um, so this is a screenshot of a demo R markdown file. So it's easy to write and um, you can add in lots and lots of commentary. Um, more than is usually convenient to do um, when you're when you're writing code. Um, you can also um, uh, show lots, show your data visualizations and the actual code itself. Um, and that just makes it easier to share with others um, or to create um, automated reports. Um, so this report I um, I exported to a GitHub flavored markdown because it's written in an R flavored markdown originally, um, and so put it we put it up on a GitHub repo and um, and it renders completely with all of the the code and visualizations as well as the long comments about what's going on and what I'm trying to achieve. So in case you want to steal any of this, like the goose, we have a GitHub repository that includes Danica's example readme file and R document, my sample markdown document and missing documentation R script, and the links we mentioned in this talk. And we also wanted to share the tools that we've mentioned are used for our work, including the Atom text editor and the fairy floss theme, in case you liked our purple screenshots the Tidyverse collection of R packages, and the Untitled Goose Game, our constant chaos inspiration. So now, after a whole 10 or so minutes, um, you have the keys to reproducibility. Um, or hopefully you have some ideas about how or where you'd like to start with reproducibility in your own work. Um, thanks, we'll be happy to take questions at the end.